I got in trouble last week. I, I wasn't clear enough, apparently. So I, I, I was telling the story last week of this, this woman that I was on a mission trip talking about, and then the lead singer of the band said, hey, just shut up, leave me alone. You're obviously in love, but go back home and marry her. I thought that was a big enough clue, but apparently I did not articulate it. That was my wife. Okay? I was actually talking about Coletta, so that was not some other woman that I thought of. That, that would be weird, I thought. Somebody's like, somebody, I mean, I had like four or five people come up to me after the service last night and go, hey, so was that Cluddy you were talking about? And I'm like, like, how weird would it be if it were not? <laughs> like, no, that was just some other random girl I did. No, 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 I mean, that was absolutely, that was absolutely my wife. And, I, and I've been kind of following our, our story a little bit, not because our story is particularly important to you, but simply because it illustrates the significance of these, these moments when we have a conversation where everything kind of hinges in the conversation. Things change a little bit. We've been using that sort of as a parallel to a number of conversations in Scripture where God speaks to somebody in such a way that everything is different after that. These are the DGR, the Defining Relationship Conversations. Clyde and I have had a number of those over the years. That one, at about Christmas time, almost uh, 22 years ago, when she came down, and I didn't know how it was going to go, but she looked at me and she said, Okay, I, I think... I think I can be with you. And again, you weren't here last week. The reason she was hesitant was because I thought at the time I was going to be doing music ministry. We were going to be on the road all the time. And that was, that was a difficult life. And so she was trying to figure out, is it, is it really what I can do? And, and so she got to the point with God where she said, yeah, absolutely, I can do that. And so that was a huge moment. Obviously, we, we got engaged not too long after that. And uh, we got married back in 1993, almost 21 years ago. And I would like to say that after that one conversation, it was all good. That we didn't have any other moments where we had to sort of step back and go, where, where are we? What's going on? We have. And part of the reason I think we've had to have those is because my life doesn't look like what I expected it to look like. I, I, this is not what I expected. Can we turn this mic down just a little bit? I'm ringing back. I didn't, I didn't anticipate pastoral ministry. I, I didn't anticipate any of the kind of things that I'm doing. I actually originally thought I was going to be doing quantum physics. Yeah. I know, he, I know. And what God has done is, is he has not ever sat in front of me and gone, okay, hey, Craig, I want you to come with me, and here is the next 80 years. Has anybody had that experience? Next eight years, even? Next eight days? That's asking a lot sometimes, and I think partly that's the grace of God, because I think sometimes if God showed us everything we were headed towards, we would run screaming in the other direction. But, but what God does is he, he just shows us bits and pieces along the ways. And, and sometimes in, in our marriages, Flood and I have since God's leading and we look at these next moves. They've been significant moves. They've been scary moves. And, and I can't say that Clud has ever said, whatever you say, Craig, is totally fine. And that's okay because I'm not infallible. It's not like I have an unerring ability to hear God's voice perfectly. So she should ask questions and we should work through things together. And that's absolutely what's happened. But what I'm incredibly thankful for over the last 21 years of marriage is that even though she doesn't think that I'm necessarily infallible, and she doesn't necessarily know that my view of what's going to happen in the future is necessarily right, she has been content to go into that future with me. She doesn't know what the future is going to hold, but she has been content to face that future with me. And sometimes that's all we can ask for. We don't know what the future holds, but we need to know who we face the future. And that is the subject, it's the big idea, really, of, of DTR, another defining the relationship conversation that we find in the book of Exodus. So if you have your Bible, let that be turned with me to Exodus chapter 3, where actually we see what may be, in fact, the strangest DTR conversation ever. <coughs> Exodus chapter 3, of course, begins to deal with the story of Moses, and it, I think we probably need a little bit of backgrounds to understand this particular DGR. So as you're turning, let me say this. Um, we, we looked last week at Abraham and the, the promises that was, were given to Abraham that God would give the land of Canaan to him. We saw principles that he had to obey first and obedience precedes blessing. And we saw that obedience requires faith. And, and as we began to unpack those things, one of the things that was difficult for Abraham was that he'd been told you're going to be made into a great nation, but Abraham didn't have any kids. But God intervened and he gave him a child, and that child's name was? Anybody? It was Isaac. And 
and Isaac had a couple of kids. One of them was named Jacob, and Jacob was renamed Israel, and Israel, which means the people of God. And Israel had a whole bunch of kids, 12 sons, actually. And the next, yeah, so Springer's got to be there. You need to get busy. But maybe not, because, you know, towards the end of that line, the next to last kid was named Joseph. And he had what we might call a bit of a sibling rivalry with the rest of his brothers. So, so much so that, uh, anybody get along perfectly, brothers and sisters? Anybody had some significant blowouts with brothers and sisters? Well, I, I'm pretty sure you've never had one like this. Joseph was actually sold to slave traders. Yeah, they threw him in a well, they sold him to slave traders, and he ended up down in Egypt. I mean, that was sibling rivalry, right? But, but God, who was merciful and gracious, God did a great good from that great evil. And, and Joseph rose to power, and he became one of the most prominent men in all of Egypt. So when this huge famine in the land, Joseph was able in mercy and grace to bring his family down from Canaan into Egypt and to provide for them and protect them while they were in the midst of this famine kind of thing. But then Joseph died. And when Joseph died, things get a little bit muddy. On the one hand, there's a couple things that we can say very clearly. In fact, if you have your Bible just open to Exodus, just flip back a few pages to the very end of the book of Genesis. And one of the things we're going to see is that it's very clear that Joseph expected his family to return to the promised land, to return to Canaan pretty soon. <coughs> there's a couple of reasons I say that, but you can certainly see the confidence that he expected them to go back at some point. Joseph said to his brothers, this is verse 24 of chapter 15, Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and he will take you up out of this land, to the land that he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath that he said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from this place. And so Joseph died at the age of 110. And after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Obviously, Joseph expected his family to return to the promised land, and that's just perfectly understandable because that's where God said the promise was going to be fulfilled. That's where the blessings were going to flow. And as we talked about last week, if, if God says the blessings flow here, you can't have your cup overflowing if you're holding it out over here. And so he expected them to go back. I think it's also pretty clear that he expected them to go back fairly soon. <coughs> There's a couple of reasons I say that. Number one, it's the fact that he made his brother's promise. Now, Joseph was pretty old. He was in his hundreds at this point. And yet he obviously had been outlived by at least a few of his brothers, and he gathered his brothers, the sons of Israel, the sons of their father, and he said, hey, I'm going to die, but when you go back, make sure you take my bones. That they were both, for the most part, older than him, and he was already really old and dying, so certainly when he made them promise, the idea seems to be implied there that you're going to be heading back soon. And, and I think that would be very natural because, of course, once Joseph died, there was no reason why the Egyptians should have looked favorably on the Israelites. Joseph was loved. His family had his protection. But once Joseph died, it would be natural for Joseph to go, yeah, but once I'm gone, why would you hang out here? Why would you stick around? The other reason I say I think it's clear that he expected them to go back soon is in 26. It says, Joseph died at the age of 110 years. And after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. And the word coffin is interesting there. The Hebrew word is actually Aron. And it, it's the only time I've ever seen it used for coffin. I, there, there are words for coffin, and in Egypt, of course, when somebody died, maybe you've seen Indiana Jones and things like that. When somebody died, they put him in like a sarcophagus, right? Well, those are big, heavy things, and that's not what Aron means. Aron usually means a portable chest. And in fact, this is the same word that was used for the Ark of the Covenant. It was called an Aron, and you remember the Ark of the Covenant, right? It's the box where they kept the Ten Commandments, the box where the... Nazis got their faces melted. <laughs> okay? Yeah, so I mean, the point of that, it was called in our own because it was portable. That was the whole idea. You could travel around with it. And here it's used not in its normal sense. You wouldn't usually expect to put a body in our own, in a portable chest. And I think the reason that we're using that, we see that bigger word, is because Joseph basically said, don't put me in a tomb. You know, the Egyptians like me, so they might be tempted to bury me in a sarcophagus like, like the big people, but don't, I don't want you to do that. He, so they put his body into a chest, a portable chest, and the idea there is clearly, you're going to be leaving. You're going to be headed back to the promised land, so when you do, <coughs> that's pretty clear. But what's also pretty clear is they didn't go. In fact, what we know from later scriptures, they spent hundreds more years in Egypt. 
And I think we're supposed to ask the question, why? Well, why didn't they fulfill Joseph's expectation? Why didn't they go home quickly? Why did it take so long? And, and I don't know that we have a good answer, although I think we begin to see clues throughout this whole thing. But I think maybe at the end of the day, it's, it's nothing more complex than the fact that it's a long way. And, and it's, it's a hard journey. And you know what? Things are comfortable here. Because after all, it's not as though once they got to the promised land, they would own that. They hadn't seen God's promise fulfilled yet. So there were already other people living there. So if they went there, they were going to have to deal with other people. And, you know, in Egypt, they, you know, they had houses and they had land and they had food. And for a while, at least, they had the good favor of the Egyptians. So why? And so really what seems to have happened is they were satisfied enough with the present to lose sight of the promise. Yeah, what God promised was way better. God promised sovereignty. God promised their own land. And that's way better. But what we got now is not so bad. And especially when getting from where we are now to where God says we're immediately going to be, eventually going to be, that, that, that's tough. It's rough. And I don't know. And so I think they became focused on the present. They became comfortable in the present. And they lost sight of the promise. And that's not a good place to be. It's not a good place. Because... When we become comfortable with the present, two things happen. Number one, we stop looking at God, don't we? And, and sometimes we, we sort of look backwards. We're like, God, thanks for this. Thanks for doing this. I'm really grateful for it. It's a good deal. Awesome. I appreciate it. But what we do is we become so focused on where we are, and, and we say thanks for where we are, but we lose sight of the God who brought us there. And when he's moving on to something else, we don't see it. So when we lose sight of God and we focus on the present, we stop being able to live in faith. We stop being willing to move when God calls us. That's a very good principle. Don't ever get so comfortable in what God has done for you that you cease looking for what God wants to do. Here's the thing. God's never done. There's no such thing as good enough. God is he's maximal in every respect. He, he doesn't just know a little bit of stuff. He knows everything. He doesn't just have some power. He has all power. And he's not just a little good. He's all good. And he seeks the most possible good in everyone's life. He seeks the most transformation, the most peace, the most joy, his, his greatest glory in you. And so God may have done great things in your life. And you may look back and say, Lord, thank you for that. And that's great. But don't ever become so focused on what God has done for you that you lose sight of what he wants to do. Don't ever be so content, well, God has brought me out of this. Oh, good. That you lose sight of the fact that he wants to bring you out of so much more. And he wants to bring you in to so much more. That seems to be what happens to the Israelites. And it causes a tremendous problem. Because I'm sure that it went for them like it did for everybody else. At first, it was comfortable. And at first, everything was good. And then the sentiment began to turn. And the Egyptians began to think more negatively about them. And it began to get harder and harder. But you know how it is. You can measure yourself. Oh, it's just temporary. It'll get okay. But it didn't get okay. It got really bad. So eventually they became slaves. And that's where we begin to pick up the story of Moses. And you probably know a little bit about Moses, right? Moses is the, the guy who... Pharaoh tried to kill all the Egyptian babies, but his mother put him in a basket and sailed him down the river, and the Pharaoh's daughter picked him up. And so Pharaoh, or Moses was actually raised in the Pharaoh's house. But he was also a Hebrew. And at a certain point, when he was about 40 years old or so, he saw an Egyptian abusing an Israelite. And he stepped in, and he, and he protected the Israelite, and he killed the Egyptian. And then... Things didn't go the way he expected. And I don't know what he was looking for. I don't know what he was expecting exactly, but probably not what actually happened, which was the Israelites looked at him and they said, who are you? Did somebody put you in charge of this? What makes you think that, that we need you? What do you think? Are you going to kill us too? And so Moses kind of panicked and he ran and he went into the desert and he spent about 40 years there. He became a shepherd. And that's where chapter 3 of Exodus picks up. Told that Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. 
And Moses saw that the bush was on fire and it did not burn up, and so he thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. I love the way scripture just sort of like skims over. It had to be a ridiculous emotional reaction on Moses' part. Can you imagine if you were out someday in a field and you're like, whoa, that bush is on fire. That bush is still on fire. It's still... Because he's got nobody to look back to except she. It's, it's not burning up. So he, you know, he must have sort of like, I don't know if he raced over there, or tiptoed over there, but I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush doesn't burn up? But when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from the bush. And this story just gets weirder, doesn't it? So now we've got a talking bush. Now, we know it's the Lord, but as far as Moses is concerned, the bush is now talking. Moses, Moses, he called. And Moses said, uh, I'm here. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you're standing is holy ground. Now, that holy ground is interesting. It's actually the first time in all scripture that we've seen the word holy used as a noun, as a way of describing something. What it literally says is, the place where you're standing is holiness. Now, there's no reason why Moses should have thought that. Okay? Understand, this is called the mountain of God, but that wasn't a term that the people, the shepherds used. It wasn't a term that his father-in-law used. That was the word that Moses came to describe that place. So years later, when he's giving the story to the Israelites after their freedom from Egypt, and they're asking questions about this experience, it's like, yeah, there was this burning bush, and they're like, where was that? And he goes, he, he's able at that point to travel. And he goes, it was there. It was this mountain. And they came to call it the mountain of God. So that was a later kind of a thing. But there hadn't been any reason to call it holy up to this point. There wasn't anything special about the mountain yet. But that's what's so interesting about God. Unlike the other deities of the ancient Near East, and like the foreign gods who had to live in holy places, and they had these special high places, and they had these special things, God doesn't have special holy things. Things become holy when God uses them. <coughs> you know what I'm saying? It wasn't a special mountain until God showed up. And that's the way God always functions. God doesn't pick special people. He doesn't pick righteous, holy people. He picks people and they, they embrace him and in faith they come to know him and they become holy. They become what they were not. That's great. Because how many of you feel really holy right now? How many of you would like to be holy? Yeah, it's church. You have to say yes. I know. But sometimes the, the, the step from where I am to where I'd like to be, that's hard how we get there. And the answer is you trust God. You trust in Jesus. He will make you holy because that's what he does. He doesn't come to holy places. He comes to places that become holy when he gets there. He comes into the lives of people who become holy when they trust in him. He says, take off your sandals. The place that you're standing is holy. And then he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. That's, that's an interesting statement. I think it's an interesting statement, partly because I'm a little surprised he hasn't done it already, aren't you? I mean, there's a burning bush. He realizes it's not burning up, so it's obviously something supernatural is going on. Then a voice speaks to him and says, Moses, take off your sandals. It's holy ground. And he pulls his sandals off. It's holy ground. It's interesting that he hasn't covered his face yet. And I think the reason for that is because this is not a face covering that comes from reverence. There are later times in Scripture where people realize that God is present, and because they realize, you know, you're God and I'm not, it's a reverential thing. It's the same thing you did for kings. You wouldn't look at them until they told you to look. But I don't think that's what's going on here. I don't think this is a reverence. I think this is a fear. In fact, it said it said, doesn't it? He was afraid to look at God. But the question we need to ask is why? What was it about God that made him afraid? And I think it's interesting that when he was told this is holy ground, he didn't cover his face. He seems to cover his face when he heard, I am the God of your fathers. Why should that cause him to hide his face? And I think the answer is because Moses had done what the rest of the Israelites had done. They had forgotten about him. They had forgotten about the God of their fathers. If you keep your fingers there, Turn back with me to 
just chapter 2. I want you to notice something. Chapter 2, verse 23. We're told this. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. That's the king of Egypt that had known Joseph. And the Israelites groaned in their slavery, and they cried out. What's interesting is that phrase, cried out, is very common. It's used throughout the Old Testament, but in almost every single instance, it's accompanied by a preposition. They cried out to, and there was a statement of God. They cried out to God. It happens dozens and dozens of times throughout the entire Old Testament. People become enslaved. People become oppressed by foreigners. They cried out to God. But here, it doesn't say to God. It just says they cried out. And then it goes on to say their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. And it's interesting. The grammar of the Hebrew is very strange. It doesn't imply they cried out and God heard. What it implies is they cried out just sort of generally, vaguely. But God was listening in spite of the fact that it wasn't being directed to them. What seems to have happened is the Israelites had forgotten about God. Maybe he was there as part of the process. Maybe he was one of the gods of the Egyptians. Maybe he was part of the package. But they didn't see him as the one to whom they could cry out. They didn't see him as one from whom their help would come. So we just had these vague, well, they cried out. And it was Moses who finally realized this is the God of your fathers. And the senior realized, oh, you're the God who spoke to Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob. At that moment, he hid his face because he was afraid. And I think the reason for that is because he was afraid because he knew he had forgotten about that God. He knew the stories, he remembered it, but he was not the one that he had ever turned to. The Lord said this. He said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. And that's interesting, too. In English, I have indeed seen. It's very strongly emphasized in the Hebrew. The Hebrew does this by giving two verbs at a time. So literally, literally he says, and seeing I see. And it's a way of saying this is really important. He says, I have indeed seen. And again, I think the reason for the emphasis is because it's stating something about the character of God. He says, they haven't cried out to me. They haven't called out to me. They haven't remembered me. But you know what? never stopped looking. I've seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out. Again, not crying out to me. I just heard them crying out. Because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. Notice he doesn't say I'm answering their prayer. He doesn't say I'm responding to what they call for. He just says, I'm concerned. It's all in within him. They've cried out, and I have been watching even though they haven't called to me. But I care about it. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. So what do you think that come down means? It's a little bit strange, isn't it? Because, of course, where is God? He's everywhere, right? So why would he come down? Does that mean he came down out of the heavens? Well, that's not the God that we see in Scripture. And I think the answer is that he's not talking about coming down from the top of a mountain or coming down out of the heavens. He's using the same language that Genesis uses. To speak about the trip from Canaan to Egypt. You went down from Canaan to Egypt. And so what he says is, I called my people to this land. And I said I will bless you and I will pour out blessings and you will have this land. And I protected you. I took you down to Egypt for a brief time to protect you. And now I'm waiting for you to come to where my blessings are. Oh, you're going to come. And that doesn't go so well, and eventually it turns into a very bad thing. And, and like a frog in the kettle, you don't realize the heat's burning and getting hotter and hotter and hotter, and you don't jump out. And now things are really bad, and you're not even crying out to me, but you know what? I still care about you, so you know what? If you won't come where I come, I will go to where you are. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, if the mountain will come to Muhammad, Muhammad will go to the mountain? This is the exact opposite of that. This is basically saying, if you won't come to the mountain, guess what? mountain will come to you. That's our God. Yes, he says, here's where the blessings are, and if you won't put your cup under there, you won't experience it. But God in his mercy and grace goes, and now you're trapped in your disobedience. Now you're trapped in your faithlessness. But I won't give up on you. I won't leave you abandoned there. So the mountain comes to them. He has come down, and you notice actually he reverses it. He says, I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up going down to Egypt to bring them back to where they're supposed to be. Into a land that is good and spacious. A land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites is reaching. And they've come the way of Egypt. 
and I have come. I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing you. And so now I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Moses has just been given an incredible task. I have picked you. I've chosen you. You're going to go and you're going to release my people from Egypt. And Moses said to God, um, can we talk about that? His actual words were these. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring these points out of Egypt? You don't, you don't really want me. You don't really want to. I mean, I don't, I don't have what it takes. I don't, I don't have what's needed. You've you got to be kidding me. And so he asked God a question. Who am I? It's interesting, God doesn't answer the question. What God actually says is not who you are. I mean, we might expect him to say, who are you? Oh, you know, don't worry about it. You've got what it takes. Don't worry about it. I, even I've given you what's necessary. But we don't get any of that. What we instead get God to say is this, I will be with you. In other words, who are you? No, I mean, you must have misunderstood the question. It's not about you. I'm not sending you off to do this for me. I'm sending you off to do this with me. I'm going with you. You, you don't think you have what it takes? Well, that's fine. You're right. But I'm not asking you to do it. I'm going with you. Listen to me. God never sends us to do something alone. You hear me? God will never call you to do something on your own. God will always call you to do something with him. He will always go with you. And usually find he's gone ahead of us and he's prepared the way. You will never be sent off on your own. But Moses doesn't know that yet. So he asks, well, who am I? And God says, it doesn't matter who you are because I am going with you. And this will be a sign to you that it's I who has sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this very mountain. But Moses said to God, listen, suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And, and they ask me, what, what is his name? And who shall I tell them? So Moses' first question is, who am I to do this? And God goes, it doesn't matter who you are because we're going to do this together. And Moses' next response is, okay, yeah, but they're going to ask me who you are and what am I supposed to tell them? And there's a lot more significance to this question than we tend to read. I think for us in the American world, especially in the Western world, we tend to read this as he's looking for a label. He's looking for, he's looking for some, you know, some proper noun, some name by which to call this God. And yet, here's the interesting thing. He already knows which God it is, doesn't he? He already knows that it's the God of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob, the God of his fathers. He already knows who it is, so when he's asking for this name, he's not asking for a label. What he's really asking for is, who are you? What is it about you that would give me confidence that you can do this thing that you're saying you can do? In the ancient world, names were not labels. In the ancient world, names were windows. They were windows on the character and the nature of something. That's why whenever God calls somebody to himself, he often changes their name. And so Abram becomes Abraham. Jacob becomes Israel. Because the name is not a label. It's a window into the nature and the character of the thing that was being talked about. And that's what Moses is asking. Who are you? What is it about you that would give me confidence? Because th here's the deal. Like, when I get down there and I say, a burning bush talk to me, they're going to go, what? I know. Well, it was the God of, of our fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. And their natural response is going to be, yeah, we remember the stories, but what has he done for us lately? Anybody ever ask God that? Good. Don't ever ask God what he's done for you lately. But that's what they were basically asking. Uh, we, we've been enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years now. And yeah, we remember the stories. We've heard about it. We remember the promise. But you know what? What makes you think he can do anything? And that's what they're asking for. And so it's interesting. God's answer doesn't really fit the bill. What we expect God to say is something like, you want, to, you want to know who I am? Tell them I am El Shaddai. Tell them, in other words, I am the powerful one. I am the God of power. That would be a good answer. Or maybe, you know, tell them I am El Elyon. I am the high one. I am the mighty one. I am the highest of gods. Tell them that. Or, or even I am El Olam. I am the everlasting one. Those are the names that we expect. Instead, we get something that doesn't even make sense grammatically. God said to Moses, you, you want to know who I am? You want a name? Okay, here it is. Tell them I am sent you. Literally, it says, I am who I am. And I'm sure Moses thought, yeah, that's not going to help. 
to me, I am. And this is the, the beginning of this famous thing in Old Testament studies we call the Tetragrammon. That is, it's, it's four letters. And it's basically it's the Hebrew verb for be. And he says, you want to know who I am? Tell him, I am. So. I am. I am who I am. Not El Yo, not El Shaddai, not El Elam, just I am. And here's where my sermon preparation ends. Not because I didn't plan, but because I couldn't figure out. I've been struggling with this all week. I, I can't for the life of me figure out how to convey what that means. God's answer doesn't fit the bill. It doesn't fit the categories. It doesn't fit the expectations. God says, you know who I am? I am a being itself. Does that help anybody? No? I am the foundation of all existence. I am the ontological ground of all that is. Anybody feeling clarity yet? This is the problem. I, all of that's entailed, but how, how do you begin to unpack that? And I, I, I don't know how to do it other than to say that, you know, what, what you seem to have is Moses going, please give me something that I can work with. Who are you? What should you give us confidence that you can do this thing? And God speaks and says, who am I to do this? I am. Before anything was, I am. Before all other gods, I am. Before all other powers, I am. Before everything that you turn to for strength, I am. Moses, you don't think you're good enough? Guess what? I am. You don't think you're strong enough? I am. You don't think that you're knowledgeable enough? I am. You don't think you're brave enough? I am. You don't think you're confident enough? I am. They're going to come and they're going to say, we, we're, we're too afraid. We don't, we don't have what it takes to face up against the, the Egyptians. We don't have what we need. And God says, you want to know what to tell them at that point? You tell them, I don't think you have what it takes. I don't think you have what we need. I do. Because I am. I mean, it, it's, it's, this, it's this thundering statement. And I have to imagine that when, when Moses asks, who should I tell them? And God answers, like, everything got really quiet for a second. The prayer stopped your feet. The bush kind of went on mute. No more cracking. Just in this, just like eternal silence, God said, "I am." That's His name. He says, "You tell them I am who I am." That's what you're saying. I am has sent me to you. God said to Moses, said to the Israelites, "The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you." That is my name forever. But that is, it doesn't refer to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's not the God of those. It refers back to the I am. I am. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. So go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, what's your name? Mine says the Lord. Here's something if you don't know this. Underline the word Lord, and then off in your margin of your Bible write I am. Because, in fact, every, almost every time that you encounter the word the Lord in the Old Testament, it's actually an I am statement. But the Jews didn't say that out loud. They were, it, was, it wasn't respectful, so they often wouldn't speak the word I am out loud. So what they did was they added the vowels to it for Adonai, which means Lord. So when you were reading through the Holy Scriptures and you came upon this holy name of God, the I am name, you wouldn't say it out loud. You would instead say, Lord, it's a way of being respectful. But every time you encounter the word the Lord in the Old Testament, it's God, it's actually I am again. So he says, go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob appeared to you. And I have watched over you and I have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of the misery of Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the land flowing with milk. In the ancient world, a name was a window. It was a way of understanding who you were dealing with. But 
But there's another thing about names, and this is something I think we often overlook, and that is when you gave somebody your name, you gave them you gave them an opening. You gave them an opportunity. In some senses, when you gave someone a name, you were making yourself vulnerable. You revealed your name as a way of saying, I love you. I care about you. I'm interested in a relationship. And so when God said, I'll tell you what my name is, my name is I am. He wasn't just telling Moses why he could be trusted. He was also saying to Moses, come with me. Enter into a relationship. And go down to the Israelites and tell them, yes, I'm more than capable of doing what I promised, but I'm also inviting you. I'm inviting you to know me. So, where I just, I, I struggle through this whole week going, I, I don't even know that I can convey it. I can feel on some level what this answer meant. But it's just, it's a feel. And I hate feelings. Okay. I, I want to do exegesis, and I want to do theology, and I, but, but this is more about feeling than it is about theology. This is about the God of all things, the God who is before everything, the God who is underneath everything, the God who surrounds everything, who is above you. He is, he, it's about I am saying, I've been watching you, and I care about you, and I love you, and, and I, I want you to know me, and I want to know you in an intimate way. And that's the same thing he's saying to us today. You understand that? It's the same God. The same God that spoke and gave his name to Moses is the same God who speaks right now to you and says, you're struggling? You don't feel like you have what it takes? You don't feel like you have enough? You don't feel like you are strong enough for what you're facing? Guess what? I am. Whatever you're facing right now and you feel like you can't deal with it, God says, you don't have to be strong enough because I am. Whatever you're going through right now, and you go, I, I don't, I'm not knowledgeable enough, I don't even know what to do, I, I don't know what needs to happen, I don't have enough knowledge, I'm not smart enough, I, I'm not informed enough, and God says to you right this morning, he says, don't worry about it, I am. I'm always. I'm not hopeful this can be turned around, and God says, I am. I'm not confident this can be fixed, and God says, I am. Whatever you're dealing with this morning, I am who I am says, you don't have to do it either. You do this together. I don't know what you're facing. And I don't know what your tomorrow looks like, and I don't know what your next eight days looks like, and I don't know what your year looks like. I don't know what your future looks like. I don't know what my future looks like. But I do know who I will face it. I will face that future with the one who says, I am. Wherever you run out, he has a name. I somehow feel like this isn't enough. I need to give you three steps. I need to give you four principles. I, I, but this is the truth that it needs to be the foundation of everything else in your life. So I don't want to complicate. I, I just want you to let it sink in. So just do that. Close your eyes. Bow your heads. Understand that the God who gave his name to Moses and invited the Israelites to know him is the same God who gives his name to you and invites you to know him. He's the same God who speaks into your life right now.